As many of you know, I have been pursuing a Master of Pastoral Studies part-time through Knox College since the fall of 2018. I'm also en enrolled in the Certificate of Spiritual Care and Psychotherapy through the uh, University of Toronto and the Toronto School of Theology. And in, I'm right currently in the midst of applying to the College of Registered Psychotherapists so that I can become one. And I'm completing my third and final placement as a therapist intern, and I will graduate in May. I love therapy. I love being with people and helping them almost as much as I love preaching. And I've learned a great deal about myself and about the human condition on this journey. And one of the biggest questions that we ultimately seek to answer especially in therapy, but in life in general, one of the biggest questions is that universal question of who am I? Now, this question rarely comes up directly in therapy, but our struggle with our own identity, the question of who I am, is at the very core of our existence, about how we relate to ourselves and how we relate to the world around us. And our identities, they are shaped by our culture, by our faith, by our families of origin, by our own life experience, by our relationships with others. And you could say that there is almost a, a spectrum of identity. At one end of that spectrum of identity, there are those whose identity is perhaps a little unstable or they are unsure or that it's even negative. Perhaps they come from a broken home, and instead of love, they experienced abuse, physical, emotional, spiritual, they, or they've experienced abuse at some point in their life. Or perhaps their identity, which was once further over on the continuum, perhaps their identity has just shifted or been shattered by a life-altering event, right? A divorce, a death, you get the idea. But on the other end of the spectrum, of the identity spectrum, are those people whose identity is so firmly fixed that there's no room for growth or change. That at the slightest threat or the slightest questioning of their identity of who they are, they either lash out defensively or they retreat from the threat because anything that forces them to question their identity or, or cause them to perhaps have to change or the possibility of change, it scares them because they're so fixed on that. And so they, they run and hide. And then somewhere in the middle between these two identity ends of the spectrum, somewhere in the middle, there's a sweet spot. A sweet spot of where we are able to hold our identity, to know who I am, and yet somehow hold it loosely enough that as I experience life, it can grow and change. And we don't see that as threatening. We come to new understandings of who I am. Now, and I hear some of you saying, so where is all this talk about identity and who I am? Where is it coming from? And how the heck does it relate to our scripture passages this morning? And for that, I am indebted to Chelsea Harmon. She is a minister in the Christian Reformed Church of North America, and she wrote a commentary on this morning's gospel reading for the Center of Excellence in Preaching. And in her commentary, she makes this connection with the question, who am I? And it really connected with me and hence our sermon this morning. Now, I'm gonna come back to this idea of identity in a few minutes after we discuss the gospel passage a little bit. In our text today, we have Luke's version of Matthew's Sermon on the Mount. But instead of preaching it from the mountain above, Luke has Jesus coming down the mountain to a level place and meeting the crowd there. Now, immediately prior to our passage this morning, Jesus has been up the mountain. He's been up there praying and has appointed 12 of his disciples to also be named his apostles, right? The core group of 12. 
And now Jesus comes down the mountain and he walks among the crowd, which is made up of people who have come to hear him teach and to be healed. And they've come from up to 100 miles away from places like Tyre and Sidon. And along with the crowd and the 12 apostles, there are other disciples there as well. And this helps set up the context of the teachings that Jesus is about to offer in what is sometimes called here in Luke, the blessings and the woes, instead of the beatitudes, which we know about from the Sermon on the Mount in the Gospel of Matthew. And so it is while Jesus is walking through the crowd, uh, while he's going through the crowd and healing them, that he looks up to the disciples and delivers his sermon, his teaching. And like Chelsea Harmon, I find it interesting that Luke makes it clear that Jesus is speaking to the disciples, even though the crowd is obviously listening in and has in fact come to listen to Jesus teach, but Jesus is focused on his disciples. And Harmon says, Without saying it forthrightly, Jesus' list of blessings and woes names some of the very fundamental views of human self-identity. Who am I? Am I am? Am I what I have? Am I what I do? Am I what people say about me? In his words, we hear various answers to the who am I question. I am poor, I am hungry, I am weeping, I am rejected and ridiculed. I am rich, I am content with myself. I am laughing about my success. I am someone who everyone admires. And then Harmon makes a connection with one of my favorite authors, Henry Nouwen. You might be familiar with some of Henry Nouwen's work. He was a Dutch Catholic priest who died in 1996. And he wrote, taught, and served extensively on matters of spirituality, identity, pastoral ministry, and social justice. And at the very center of his life's work was a desire for people to know their own belovedness as children of God. Everything was rooted there in that identity as children of God, as loved children of God. And so Harmon uses a sermon from Nouwen that he gave in 1992 as an example. And in it, Nouwen outlines how we often answer this question in three ways. I am what I do. I am what other people say about me. And I am what I have. And the blessings and woes in this passage from the Gospel of Luke this morning, they line up with these three answers about who I am. Weep or succeed, I am what I do. Plenty or not enough, I am what I have. And good or ill, truth or lies, I am what people say or think about me. And these blessings and woes, they help us see the importance of connection or relationship to who I am, to my identity. The disciples, they have chosen the right connection, right? As Jesus is looking up to them, delivering this teaching. They have chosen to be disciples. Jesus has chosen them to be apostles. They have left their jobs. They have left their way of life to learn from Jesus. They have chosen to be in relationship with, to identify themselves with Jesus. Now the crowds, they have come to hear and to be healed. And they have, but they have come for the moment. But the disciples, the word to disciple, it's for life. It changes who you are. Being a disciple is truly an answer to the question, who am I? And so as identities, the descriptions that we use are deeply rooted in us. They describe the connection or the relationship that we hold with what we believe to be true, whether it's positive or negative. What we believe to be true shapes our identity. It shapes who we are. Nouwen's desire for people to know that they are beloved children of God was for a purpose. Along with being extremely biblical, it is also life-giving. It is a worldview which changes us, which transforms us. 
In other words, it is exactly like every invitation from God in Scripture. It's an invitation to be rooted in Christ and God, to be loved by God, to know that at our core. Now, as a therapist and as a Christian, I believe we need to reevaluate our thoughts about identity based on how this passage tells us to answer the question, who am I? As followers of Christ, it is not about choosing to be poor or hungry or always be mourning or willingly seeking out rejection and insult. Just as we are not to seek out being rich or being content with ourselves or becoming uncaring to the needs of others while we live the good life or to try and be a friend to everybody and stand for nothing. No, the point that Jesus is making here is about connection about relationship. He's helping to give the disciples something about their identity to hold on to when the going gets tough. In spite of having experiences of need, of poverty, of hunger, of grief, of rejection, as long as Christ's disciples are connected to him, as long as they, they base their identity on being rooted in Jesus, and I'm including us here as disciples, as long as we are connected to him, as long as we are in relationship with him, we are blessed. And not only are we blessed, because we belong to him, we will experience the great reversal, right? That great upside down movement that is the kingdom of God, because we are promised the kingdom of God, a place where we will be filled, where we will experience joy and grace and hope. And so this identity, this connection, this rootedness in Christ, it propels all of Christ's disciples out into the world in any time and in any place, into the great future that God promises Jesus says that his disciples are blessed when these sufferings on our, are on account of their relationship to him as the Son of Man. And he says that when other people see this relationship to Christ so clearly that they respond to it, even if that response is negative, then his disciples ought to rejoice and leap for joy to know that their reward, the fulfillment of their identity, is yet to come. They are living into that identity. And notice the implied connection here that underlies all of these woes. Instead of God or Jesus Christ, those to whom the warnings apply appear to be connected only to themselves, only to that present moment not thinking about the future, not thinking about the needs of others, not showing care and concern for the world, only themselves. And their futures are dark and woeful, full of trouble, and the suffering they seem to not have worried about will come. Eugene Peterson offers a great interpretation of verses 24 to 26 in his translation called The Message. But it's trouble ahead if you think you have it made. What you have is all you'll ever get. And it's trouble ahead if you're satisfied with yourself. Yourself will not satisfy you for long. And it's trouble ahead if you think life's all fun and games. There's suffering to be met, and you're going to meet it. There's trouble ahead when you live only for the approval of others, saying what flatters them, doing what indulges them. Popularity contests are not truth contests. So Jesus is standing among the crowds and speaking to his disciples about identity and relationship. He is inviting them and us to continue to choose to be his disciple, to be rooted in him rather than rooted in ourselves or in our circumstances. He is laying out before us the mindset that will allow us to be rooted in him, allow us to be rooted in the truth, no matter our circumstances. And for me, this really connects with our other readings from the Hebrew Bible this morning, from Psalm 1 and Jeremiah 17. 
Both of these passages use that image of a rooted tree, as I talked about with the children this morning. In verses eight to 10, Jeremiah says, they shall be like a tree planted by water, sending out its roots by the stream. It shall not fear when heat comes and its leaves shall stay green. In the year of the drought, it is not anxious and it does not cease to bear fruit. The heart is devious above all else, it is perverse. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, test the mind and search the heart to give to all according to their ways, according to the fruit of their doings. Friends, may our roots be planted firmly in Christ so we know who we are and the world knows whose we are. Amen. Our hymn, number 574, with the Lord as my guide. <laughs> 